according to your wish. According to your wish. My life is not my own. Well, hi, and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. Here being, once again, England. We'll, we're yes. still in England and will be for another few months. Um, we're continuing on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is our 23rd week, our 23rd chapter in this study. Mm -hmm. The study of, and I'll say it again, the most radical, Amen. the most promising, the most wonderful sermon that you will ever hear. From Jesus Christ. Okay. His first sermon. First, as he had gathered his disciples right. and named his apostles. It's very important that you understand that. Um, we're going to start where we left off in last week, talking about uh, how Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon, and we'll pick that up. We're, in, we're studying the Sermon on the Mount from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And we'll be picking up at verse 25 in the 6th chapter of Matthew this week. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Alice, my lovely bride, Alice, if you'll ask, God. ask God's blessing on our time together today. Hallelujah. Father, we do. We come before you with humble hearts and ask you to guide and direct and speak through yes, Alan and let the word that he speaks out touch hearts, change lives. And we just praise you and thank you for this wonderful, wonderful word. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, as when we left off last week, we were talking about the fact that Jesus said you cannot. Not that you should not. He's saying you cannot. It's impossible to serve God and mammon. Wealth, riches, call it, call it what you want. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then he goes on in verse 25 of the 6th chapter to say, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat, what you will drink, or your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So what he's saying is because of this, because you can't serve God and, and the world, the things of the world, the riches of the world, because of that, therefore, he's saying don't be worried, don't be anxious for these things. Because, as, and this is what we ended up talking about, mm -hmm. if you are, it's like, uh, you know, it's like when the apostles were going across the Sea of Galilee right. in the boat in a storm, or, or they saw Jesus coming across, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. walking on the water. And Peter said, if that's you, Lord, call me. And so Peter got out and walked on water, did the impossible, yes. and went over to Jesus Christ. But when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and began to look at, at the waves around him, at the situation around him, mm -hmm. he began to sink. Right. Well, I, I promise you this. If you take your eyes off of Jesus Christ and put them on the anxieties, the cares of the world, you'll sink. sink. You'll go down like, you'll just, I mean, like bada bing, bada boom, straight to the bottom. However, praise God, Jesus is there and he won't give up on you. He lifted down and Went down took, and took Peter, okay? But you have to get that. Yeah, you, you can't serve God and mammon. Okay. So let's go to verse 26. That's where we'll start on this session. Jesus said, Look at the birds of the air. They, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? This is important. This command, did you realize this was a command? Yes. Did you realize this was a command when Jesus said, look, look at the birds? This is not just about, uh, uh, you know, take a glance at a bird the next time you see one walking by as you're going by. Look at them. This is kind of like, this is akin to David saying in the Psalms, Psalm 8, um, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. It, it means that you're to meditative, meditatively, is that a word? I don't know, it is now. <laughs> it is now. You're supposed to meditate on what God has done, what he is pointing out here. Mm -hmm. All right, now the reason for that um, is because, as Paul says in Romans, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, Paul says, for the, since the creation of the world, his, God's invisible attributes, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood 
through what has been made. Okay? So, when Jesus says, look at the birds. Now, let me just tell you, in, if you go to Vine's Expository Dictionary of the Greek language, you'll see that the Greek word that's used here, emblepo, implies, and I'm quoting, implies a close, penetrating look. It's not just a glance. It is, it is to look at this and consider what you're seeing. To meditate on it, to consider it deeply, all right? So when Jesus said, look at the birds, he's telling you that, that God will speak to you through what he has created. He is trying to communicate. What is he trying to communicate? He's trying to communicate, as Paul said, his, divine, his eternal power, his divine nature, and his invisible attributes. This is what God wants to show you. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So he says he takes care of the birds. They don't. They don't have to. You know, it's not because they earned it or anything. All right. But here is the question: Are you not worth much more than they? Now, if Jesus asks a question, do you think that it demands an answer? And I'm talking about not just asking a question out into the year. If he asks you a question, does it not demand an answer? Like when Jesus said to his apostles, Who do you say I am? That demands an answer. So, in order for you to truly understand the first part of this verse, you've got to understand what Jesus is asking, what this question implies, what the answer will reveal. All right? Are you not worth more than them? How much are you worth? This is what it's all about. What's your value? That's what I think the New King James says, you know. What, what, what's your value? Well, let's just look at this in a natural. What? Okay. The average human body is composed of, and I'm just going to give you some statistics. 65% oxygen. That's air. That's free, right? 18% carbon, 10% hydrogen, 3% nitrogen, 1.5% calcium. You writing this down? Don't. 1% phosphorus, three, like 3.5 three tenths of a percent of potassium, a quarter of a percent of sulfur, a little bit of sodium, a little bit of chlorine. This sounds like another science class. It sounds like another science class. <laughs> Because he's revealing something, all right? That's right. And, and I'm not going to read them all, but your body contains trace amounts of other elements, such as silicon, manganese, fluoride, copper, zinc, all this stuff. And doesn't that make sense? I mean, God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, right. Right. out of the elements of the earth. He right. formed Adam, right? Mm. Breathed life into him with his, with his breath. Right. Okay. So, if you, if you were to take the average human body, and the components of it, all these things that I just mentioned, mm -hmm. you'd find that you're worth about a buck, about one U.S. dollar. <laughs> oh. So, now, I'm going to read to you, because I thought this was pretty cool. This is from the New York Times. Uh, they, they run a site called about.com. And th th they say, let's see if we can bump the price up a bit. If you're looking to make a buck with your body, your best bet would be to sell individual organs. Mm. But that's illegal, see? So an alternative might be to tan your hide for use as leather. Your skin would be worth about three and a half dollars if it were sold at the price of a cow hide, which runs about 25 cents per square foot. So if you take a dollar's worth of elements plus the value of your skin, you might be able to get up around four and a half dollars. Well, we'll round that up to five dollars, okay? So you feel better about your chemical value. Leaving that behind all right now, the worth or value of a commodity now, does that make you feel good? You're worth, you're worth less than, your, your body is worth less than $5 if you look at it in and the natural. Right. All right? And then with a monetary value. But at the end of the day, in reality, what really establishes value in the world, I mean, you know, go to an auction house, it's what somebody is willing to pay for it. It's what somebody's willing to pay. It's almost like it's market driven. It's that's what establishes a value is what somebody's willing to pay for something. I mean, you can you can want to charge anything you want for for a product, but at the end of the day, it's only what somebody's willing to pay that's going to determine 
its value. Right. That doesn't mean that's what it's, well, it does mean it's what it's worth, okay? You know, I used the example years ago, and I think I've, I've shared this here before in our Bible study series. Back in the early 80s, very early 80s, around 1980, <laughs> uh, I was in Florida, and I, Alice and I were traveling around the country, and I was preaching at a, a Salvation Army. Did you know that was a church? Sometimes it is, sometimes it was. Well, so anyhow, I was preaching at this church, and they had a bunch of prisoners in from a work release program. And during the course of what I was preaching, which is just kind of spontaneous and off the cuff, I don't, I don't remember what brought it up, but I said, you know, talking to these prisoners that were there in the back of the room, I said, what are you worth? And at the time, I don't know, in the United States, we have a, as here in England, there's a minimum wage. And back then, I don't recall what it was. Maybe, you know, I'm not, this is not an exact figure, but let's say it was around $4 an hour. So one of the fellows in the back popped up and he said, well, that's, I'm worth $6 an hour. And, and they started going back and forth saying, you know, I'm worth $15 an hour. Okay, so hold on. Now, the pastor of this church was a beautiful brother, dear brother in the Lord, mm -hmm. who had, prior to becoming saved and, and going into ministry, had been a rock and roll musician. Mm -hmm. And one thing he had carried from his old life into his new life as a minister was a guitar that was very precious to him <laughs> because it was a very, very expensive guitar. At the time, now remember, this is 1980. I think this guitar was worth like $5,000. So... I walked over across the platform and I picked up his guitar, a true test of his faith. <laughs> and I said to him, what's this guitar worth? And he said, he said it's worth $5,000. And I said, well, suppose you wanted to sell it. And you put it on the market. And not a single person in the world would pay more than $3,000. What's the guitar worth? Well, it would be worth $3,000. Whatever anybody's willing to pay for it. Right. If you couldn't get more than that, that's, that's all it's worth. But by the same token, if somebody walked through the door and said, I've been looking for exactly that guitar for years. I, that guitar, I want it. I want it. And said, I'll give you $10,000 for that guitar. How much is the guitar worth? It's worth the $10,000. It's worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. Okay? Now consider the Apostle Paul's words in his letter to the church at Corinth. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. That's 1 Corinthians 6.20. You have been purchased with a price. The Lord who watches over His word to perform it has then fulfilled His promise that He made through the prophet Isaiah more than, more than 2,700 years ago. Because God spoke through Isaiah and said, But now thus says the Lord your Creator, O Jacob, and He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You see, to be a redeemer, in, in, the, in the Hebrew, the word is goel. And literally what it means is it's somebody who has the right to purchase back a kinsman. Right. Typically, like to, or to pay a ransom to buy them back from bondage mm -hmm. to a foreigner. Mm -hmm. That's what a redeemer meant. Right. So when we say we've been redeemed, what it literally means is what Paul is saying. We've been purchased. We've been bought. We've been ransomed. And that's exactly what the Word of God says. All right? So let's think about this. What did it cost for God the Father to purchase you? What did it cost for Him to ransom you? What price did He pay to buy you? It wasn't five shekels. It wasn't five dollars. It wasn't five pounds sterling. The price he paid to purchase you was his own son, his only begotten son, Jesus the Christ. So if he was willing to pay Jesus Christ for you, how much are you worth? You are worth Jesus Christ. And it's so important to understand this, because God, who is no redeemer of man, right, mm -hmm. paid exactly the same price for you as he paid for me. He paid exactly the same price for the Apostle Paul as he paid for you. He paid, name, name who, you, uh, Billy Graham, I mean, name somebody that you want, whoever you want to name. He paid the same price for us. Because you can't get a higher value than Jesus Christ. And he paid Jesus Christ for the least of those persons who say, Yes, Lord, I want you as my Lord and Savior. Until, until you get this concept. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look at the birds. 
God takes care of them. He takes care of every need they have. Aren't you worth more? How much are you worth? Because when you begin to understand this, that that is your worth, that that is your value, then you'll begin to understand what Paul also wrote to the Romans when he said, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Amen. If God, that's Romans 8.32, by the way. If God the Father loved you so much that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to redeem you, do you honestly think that he who owns all the cattle on a thousand hills, he who everything on the earth is his, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, do you think, having given you Jesus, he's going to withhold a loaf of bread? Well, that's ridiculous. Of course it is. And that's what Jesus is saying. He is just trying to communicate this simple truth. How much you are worth. And therefore, if God takes care of the other things, little things like the birds, and he does, by the way, how much more is he going to take care of you? You know, I was just thinking about how Jesus didn't speak anything unless he heard it from the Father. Amen, that's right. And when we were doing the, uh, you were doing a study on not only science, about the moon and the stars, right, about yes, God's yeah. creation. And you had said that that was God's sermon when he spoke right. the creation into existence. Right. And, and I see here that Jesus, again, is listening to the Father through his sermon, Absolutely. God's sermon. By using, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when, yes, that's what we talked about this. Uh, I had the opportunity to here in England in the last few weeks to preach or teach uh, a couple of times on what I just read to you from Psalm 8, when, when David says, when I consider the moon, the stars, and the right. And how God, that's, it's not, this was not a sermon or a teaching on the moon. No. It was the sermon that the moon is preaching to us. Right. Because God uses his creation, creation to speak to us. Right. I mean, this is a glorious truth yeah. once it starts to become a reality in you, right? Because it'll set you free when you understand these things. Mm. It'll set you free from all the anxiety, all of the fear, all of these trepidations, all of these concerns that you have, when you understand your value to God the Father. Right. So, you see, that provides the answer to the question that he asked. How much are you worth? Mm -hmm. Right? But think of this, what Paul wrote to the Galatians. Galatians 5.1 It was for freedom that Christ set us free. That sounds... Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, right? right? Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. But he said it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Slavery to what? This is what we talked about last week. <clears throat> that, that wealth doesn't serve you. Wealth demands that you serve it. That's why you can't serve two masters. That's why Jesus said that wealth is a master, not a servant. And God set you free from that bondage that, that wealth would put on you. And again, it's not the wealth that's the problem. It is the love of money. It's not money that is the root of all evil. It is the love of money that's the root of all sorts of evil. Okay? You've been redeemed. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't, brother, this is a good time to do it. All you got to do is... Repent of what you've been doing, change your mind about that, and ask Him for that new, mm -hmm. brand new, fresh life that He can give you right this instant Hallelujah. by just asking. But you've been redeemed not only from the sin that had you on the fast track to join Satan in hell for all eternity, but you've been set free from fear because His perfect love, which yes. casts out all fear, has been demonstrated by the price that He paid for you. That's perfect love. We know love by this, is what it says. That while we were yet sinners, he, Jesus went to the cross in our place. God has demonstrated his perfect love. This is not theory. This is not, okay, well, I, you got to believe. He demonstrated it. It says when he put Jesus Christ, he publicly displayed him on that cross. Mm -hmm. He has publicly displayed his perfect love for us. And it's that perfect love that should cast out all fear. Fear of how you're going to pay the bills tomorrow. Fear of where you're going to get the money to buy food. Fear of all of these worldly concerns. 
and we're free from anxiety because His perfect love has been demonstrated that He will freely give all that we have need of. Because you couldn't need anything more than you needed Jesus Christ. All right? So, to not be able to answer that question, what question, how much are you worth? To not be able to answer that with a resounding shout of, what are you supposed to shout? Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good, His loving kindness is ever everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He who has been redeemed from the hand of the adversary. Psalm 107, 1 and 2. We're supposed to be shouting. We're the redeemed of the Lord. This is a glorious thing. It says, you know, Peter wrote and said that we have been called out of that darkness and called into his marvelous light. We are to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us. All right? So, you know, if you don't get in the habit of proclaiming the excellencies, maybe you'll forget the great things that he's done for you. He formed the people who will declare his praise. He's called us to proclaim his excellencies. That's to praise him. This should become the habit of our lives. Because you want to know something? It preaches to you when it comes out of your mouth. That's right. You're hearing it. It speaks to you. You know, I was at a Bible study. I was doing a Bible study in Oldham in England not, just a couple of weeks ago. And I said to people, I preach all the time. I preach constantly. I am the constant preacher. Mm -hmm. To me. I'm, I find that I'm continually preaching to myself. Because I have this, as you do, this constant struggle. Right. This constant conflict the the between the spirit and the flesh. And my flesh is always... I, I, my, you know what? I can't get very far away from my flesh. No, you can't. I can't. It's, I right, know, it's I in know your that. face. I'm, it's in my face. <laughs> it's in my face. So my flesh is constantly giving me very, very bad advice. My flesh is constantly saying, Ooh, look at that. My flesh is doing all these things. And I have to, as the Word of God says, take thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And you know how you do that? Through the Word. So I find that I'm continually giving myself the Word to make sure that I don't go astray or to correct myself. So as we, as we do this, as we become a people whose lips are praising God, you will find that it will strengthen you. It will help you to walk in this freedom that God the Father so dearly purchased for you. Okay? So, we're supposed to be able to proclaim that, and we should be proclaiming that. We are the redeemed of the Lord. By the way, how do you, when do you proclaim it? Um, I'll, give you, I'll just give you an example, for example. Uh, when you're going to the grocery store the next time, and the clerk says to you, Oh, how are you? You'd say, I'm uh, redeemed. I'm redeemed. <laughs> you, got a chance to, you got a chance to proclaim it. Um, because you are. You know, you have a chance. We live in a very troubled, troubled world. I'm, I, I'm sure that you've noticed that. Mm -hmm. There are wars and rumors of wars. There are famines in diverse places. There is all kinds of trouble in the world. So when that clerk in the grocery store says to you, how are you? You can say, I'm safe. Because typically they're not. Why are you safe? Because you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what you're going to drink. You don't have to worry about these things because God has given you an assurance. And you need to be proclaiming that. Because if the clerk in the grocery store doesn't need to hear it, you do. Okay. Let's read uh, chapter 6, verses 27 to 30 now. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? <laughs> I'm just going to stop there a second. Isn't it amazing? Mm. You know, I, before I got saved, I was a consultant in New York City. Yes. And for a period of time... One of the, th the industries that I did a lot of consulting in was the fashion industry in New York City. I, I, I you know, worked in, in Manhattan, in New York City. Industry. And that's where the garment industry is centered. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you may think it's Paris or London, or, but the fact of the matter is the garment industry is driven out of New York City in what's called the, the garment center. Mm -hmm. And I had quite a number of clients there. And just as a matter of fact, the majority of people that control the industry in New York City are Jewish. Mm -hmm. After I got saved, I found that a little bit in Congress because the, God took the Jews out of bondage in Egypt, took them through the wilderness, and they went 40 years and their clothes didn't wear out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now they've got to design new fashions every season to keep people blind. That's another story. Okay. 
So anyhow, <laughs> why are you anxious about clothing? Ah, my goodness. Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil, nor do they spin. Yet, I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? The Lord says he's going to take care of you. Now, does that mean he's going to buy you 18-inch high heels or the latest fashion, the latest dresses, or men, the fanciest suits? You know what? No, it does not. Because that's not a need that you have. No. It's not a need that you have. That's a self-esteem issue. Well, it is. I'm going to tell you another thing. I mean, you know, when I left the consulting business, I got into the advertising business. Right. And I talked about that. A lot of that is driven oh, yeah. by adverts, by advertising, that is always convincing you that unless you have these things, you will not have the things that are important in life. Mm -hmm. um, what are the things that are actually important in life? Love. Joy. Joy. Peace. peace patience, patience. Kindness. Oh. Gentleness. You know what? You can't goodness. work for those things. Or you can. You can strive after them all you want, as hard as you can, but you'll never find them. But they are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They are the gift of God. And we're going to find that again at the end of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. Right? But the things that the world is telling you, you have, to, you have to somehow go out and earn and buy and get to get these things. And then when you get them, they never satisfy in any event. Mm -hmm. God is standing here saying that here, if God the Father loves you so much, he'll give you the things that you need. All right. So now... Jesus is addressing the fact that his observation, now think about this, because he makes a statement and then says, oh, you men of little faith. So he's making the observation that the people of God are not trusting in God mm -hmm. at this point. And this goes back to the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, because the Sermon on the Mount is this contrast with, from what Jesus is teaching from the tradition of the people of God. He is taking them, which in their tradition is all religion. Right. Now, I'm not using that in the, the, the sense that James used it no. you know, in his letter when he says, you know, here, here's what religion is in the eyes of God. It's taking care of widows and orphans and keeping yourself unstained, undefiled from the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm using it in the sense of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the traditions and the buildings and all the stuff that we, mankind, builds up like they did in, in Babylon to try and reach the heavens themselves, right? right? That's what religion is, in the sense that I'm using it. Jesus is constantly, in the Sermon on the Mount, contrasting what people have heard in their religious teaching, what the Pharisees are living in their religious <coughs> traditions, and he's saying, but I say to you, mm -hmm. but I say to you. Mm -hmm. That's the way you're doing it, but here's the way it's supposed to be done. So now when he makes a statement and says, oh, you men of little faith, he's saying, you guys aren't doing this. Now is the time to start doing this. Because he didn't come to judge or condemn, all right? But we need to be confronted with the reality of our, our, what we're doing. Right. You know, um, we, we're all tippy-toeing around afraid of offending one another. I don't know if you've read enough scripture to realize Jesus didn't seem to be concerned about that. Yeah. And this is not the first time nor the last time that you will hear this phrase in scripture, oh, you men, are oh, men of little faith. So, because he was seeing that. And the other thing that you need to know Solomon was the richest man that ever lived. Where did he get the riches? From God. From God. Remember, if you, if you don't remember, just go back to 1 Kings, I think it's chapter 3, um, where, where God spoke to Solomon in the night and said, ask me what you wish. And remember, he is the son of King David. He's going to become the king of, of Israel, the people of God. And he says, give me wisdom so that I can... So that serve. I can rightly serve the people of God. Mm -hmm. and, and God said to him, because you've asked this thing, and haven't asked for riches, I'm going to give you that thing that you've asked for, but I'm also going to give you riches. Mm -hmm. So the riches that Solomon had, that brought him fame around the world, and for not only around the world, I mean, for thousands of miles around, but for thousands of years around, was the gift of God. And you want to know something? It didn't impress God. Mm -hmm. It didn't impress him. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the riches of the world... 
riches that are greater than you can conceive of that Solomon had. And Jesus said, hey, he wasn't arrayed as finely as these flowers that God grew out of, you know. So when do we get to that place where we stop being impressed by the world and the things of the world and start being impressed by the things of the Creator? Remember, I'll take you back for a minute to that, to that passage in Romans when Paul is talking in the first chapter of Romans about how God reveals himself, his nature, his attributes, his power through what he's created. Mm -hmm. But he also says there's a problem because people have chosen to worship the, create, the creature rather than the creator. Rather than the creator. Mm -hmm. And because of that, God gives them over to a depraved mind. If you start, if, you know, if... if Mammon, if wealth, if riches become your God, you're worshiping what God has created. Because, you want to know something? It wasn't there before God said, in the beginning, let there be. There was no gold. There was no diamonds. There was no wealth. God created it all. And people are worshiping that stuff rather than worshiping the God who created it. So you get turned over to a depraved mind. It's a great, great danger. I'm telling you the truth. Riches don't impress God. Um, I, I think gold is probably, there is a gold standard. There used to be a, a better gold standard. But the fact of the matter is, you know, how does gold wind up at the end of the, at the, end of the picture show? You know what, how it winds up? It's pavement in the streets. <laughs> like people, asphalt. people aren't bowing down to it. They're walking, they're trampling on it. I mean, you know. We're so in the natural impressed by wealth and money and riches. And Jesus is saying, hey, yo, take a look at the flowers. My goodness, take a look at the grass. What are you kidding? That's we, impressive. But that's the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The Word of God says that you have been given the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. So when do we get to this place? When we get out of this place where we are living by little faith. That's when. Okay. So then he goes on, and I'm going to read verses 31 and 32, right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we, or what shall we drink, or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles, that's the pagans, the outsiders, mm -hmm. eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Okay. This is important, mm -hmm. because I, I'm sure that if you've been a Christian any time, you, if you're part of a Bible-believing church, you should have, you should have heard teachings on the difference between what you want and what you need. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. And unfortunately, most people can't distinguish between those two things. But here is the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Here is the God through whom all things came into being. Read the first chapter of John. Everything came into existence through Him. Yes. In the beginning was the Word. And here's what He is saying. He says, I know, your Father knows that you need all these things. what you eat, what you drink, or what you're going to clothe yourself with. Mm -hmm. Those are needs. Those are. They're, not, they're not wants, they're not strangers. There's nothing wrong with you recognizing, you know, you've got to have food, you've got to have something to drink, you've you got to have food. Covered. But that's why Paul says in Philippians, Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This is the eternal word of God. He's made a promise. My God will supply all of your needs. Why did Paul make that statement to the Philippians? I'll tell you why. Because he understood what Jesus had said here in the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of people credit Paul, a, a lot of unsaved, a lot of, or, a lot of unsaved people, many of them theologians, by the way, kind of credit Paul with creating Christianity. Hmm. Yes, it's worthy of a good laugh. The fact is, Paul only preached what he heard from God. You know, he said, be an imitator of me as I am of Christ. Jesus didn't speak anything unless he heard it from the Father. I promise you that Paul spoke the things that he heard. Okay? So, when God, when you have this utter understanding, let's just take this back a minute, because it's a, it's a progression here, what your value is to God, and that he knows that you need these basic things. So then he can have Paul promise that God will supply all of these things. 
then you have no reason to be anxious for those things. <coughs> Excuse me. Right? And since, well, what about those, I was going to say, what about all those things that are not mentioned here? Mm. You want to know? Paul wrote again to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 8. And if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. So the point is, you know, our contentment comes from having the basic things. Our contentment comes from having a relationship with God. That's where it comes from. It's not about having the newest car, the biggest house, the best job, the corner office. It's about having the basics and knowing the love of God in your life. Moving right along. If you don't get that, if you don't understand God's promise that He will supply your needs. But I, okay, i got to go back and tell one other story. Um, last year, the beginning of last year, a, a dear brother in the Lord, uh, Robert Dunlap, he's a pastor of a church in Winter Park, Florida, in Central Florida. And he and I were for quite some time doing a weekly broadcast, a two-hour broadcast, around the world over the Internet called The Pastor's Corner. And Alice and I live by faith. We've been living by faith for, for a long time. And we were renting from a, 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 a condo where we lived in Orlando, Florida, from a dear brother up in upstate New York. And the housing market being what it, what it is, in Florida particularly, but around the world, that brother was having some struggles with you know, the mortgages and so forth. But every month, we didn't have enough money to pay the rent on this thing. Mm -hmm. And every month, it took some kind of miracle of God to, to provide us the funds he supplied to pay the rent. <coughs> and in this one case, we, we're at a place where, again, you know, the rent's coming due, and there's no money from, for us to pay it. And f I don't know why, but it's just like, I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to say to this brother in New York, who I know is having some struggles? If I can't pay the rent, I know, I'm not concerned about myself. I mean, I know that Alice and I, you know, God's going to take care of us. If we're out on the street, he'll take care of us. But I, I was concerned about this brother in New York. And I said, Lord, you know, what am I going to tell him? What happens to him if I can't pay the rent? And I clearly heard the voice of God speak to me, that still small voice speak in my heart. And the Lord said to me, why are you planning on me to fail? Mm. Well, that was like a sock in the jaw. Yeah. Well, maybe not a sock in the jaw. It, uh, was, it was a rude awakening. A on that? the head. A, a bonk on the head. Because it was a rude awakening. I mean, I didn't, I didn't see it like that, but that's exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. Because the rent was a need. I mean, you know, covering. Paying the rent is not, this is not just a frilly little wish that I have. This is an actual need in our life. And it's a promise he made. And he, 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 made this, he made this promise. I'll supply all of your needs. Mm -hmm. So now, it's not, it's not about me. It's not about the brother in New York. All of a sudden, I'm saying to God, you know, and this is what he showed me. I'm planning on him to fail. That's I'm planning right. on him not to watch over his word to perform That's it. Right. I am planning on him not to keep his word which he has spoken into existence. Mm -hmm. So I had to repent, and I repented there on the spot. But later that day, I went to do this broadcast, you know, video broadcast, and I had to sure. repent and share this and repent before the world, because that's exactly what I was doing. I was planning on God to fail. And you want to know something? He never fails. Never. never it says never, in the never, Word, never, never, never. not one good promise that he has promised has ever failed to come to pass. That's right. So he will meet your needs because he has promised to meet your needs. You have to walk in that kind of faith. That's right. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you hear God speak this to you, and when you open his word and read that kind of thing, it is God speaking to you. It says he has spoken to you in these last days through his son Christ Jesus. And if you're looking at God like your brothers and sisters or other people in the world, they, the other people in the world, brothers and sisters, will fail you. So there's nobody here that you can compare God to. Absolutely. absolutely. He will not fail. Right. Yes. And he, that's right. it. He, uh, that's a, that's a, a very good point. I mean, we have a tendency to, to kind of uh, just 
there's a technical word for this, anthropomorphized, but we're not going to get into that. Okay. To, well, we, we tend to consider God a man. Right. That's why I, I, I truly cringe every time I hear somebody talk about the man yes, upstairs. It's horrible. That's, yes. It is horrible. Yeah. By the way, God the Father has said that he is not a man that he should change. That's right. All right? He's not a man. God is, is spirit. spirit. That's what the Word of God says, mm -hmm. okay? So when you, it, it, it's one thing for us to look at God and say, okay, that's what man should be. It's another thing for us to look at man and say, well, that's what God is. Ain't the case, no, baby. No, no. It's not the way it is. Men will fail you. Yes. This is what the Word of God says. Men yes. will fail you, but he will never fail. Never. Mm -hmm. He will never fail. That's a guarantee. <clears throat> okay, but there are instructions. Yes. All right, there are instructions. You know, I, I always use the example because I, I just, I, this came to me one day and I, I like it a lot. If, if somebody called me up on the telephone right now, ring, and said, oh, there's some guy standing down at McDonald's and he's handing out $100 bills, as many as you can carry away, get down there right away and, and walk away with all of this blessing. And I said, oh, man, that sounds good to me. So I hop in the car and I turn the engine on and drive and go straight down to Burger King because I like Burger King better than McDonald's. You yeah, really don't. I really don't. No. This, this is a parable. <laughs> okay. And there's nobody in Burger King giving out $100 bills. So I missed out on the blessing. Why? Because I have to do it according to his plan. You know, it's, <laughs> it's like if God says, here's the instruction for doing this, Follow and you choose to do something else, you miss out on the blessings. It's not God's fault, nor is it God's failure. That's right. But isn't that true with anything? I mean, yes, of course with it is. With equipment, any they, you, they all come with instructions, yes. and if follow and we, the instructions, and if we don't follow the instructions, it won't work. I, yeah, uh, just another a little aside here. Yeah. Um, there was a, a television advertisement in or radio advertisement. I don't recall which in in Florida uh, before we left, and it was talking about children. I don't remember what it was. People, parents having new children. And they said, isn't it too oh, bad that children, no instruction book. that it doesn't come with an instruction book. And that used to upset me like nothing. I promise you, every child comes with an instruction yes. book. Boom, bada bing. Every marriage comes with an instruction book. Bada bing, bada bing. Every job comes with an employee handbook and an instruction book. Bada bing, bada boom. God has given us everything in the here pertaining to life and godliness. Yes. Everything. <clears throat> but you have to follow the instructions. instructions. If you don't, mm. don't blame him. No. Okay. All right. Because when you don't follow the instructions, then you're leaning on your own understanding. And we know what, Absolutely. Happens, what happens. Yes. <laughs> when you lean on your own understanding, when you do it your own way, well, you, you get, you know, unfortunately, I was going to say, you'll get what you deserve. Yeah. Um, I, I thank God every day that I don't get what I deserve. Yeah. Mercy. I you get mercy. For your mercy. The, the mercies of the Lord are new each morning, it says in Lamentations 3.22. I get the mercies of God. I don't get what I deserve. Thank God that I don't get what I deserve. I get the grace of God poured out into my life. You should be thanking God every day for that too. We're called to be a people of thanksgiving. Oh, yeah. All right, let's, let's go on and read uh, Matthew 6.33. And I'm sure many of you have heard this verse. It's been made into a hundred yes. different songs. But by the way, if you use the message thingy, instead of most other translations of the Bible. Don't use this, message. Well, no, no, you won't understand anything about this verse, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you so, won't understand anything about God. No, no, but you won't understand. You, I promise you, if you're reading the message, they call it a Bible. If you're reading the message Bible, you will not understand what I'm about to tell you in That's Matthew right. 6.33 at all. You might as well go down to the New Age shop and buy you some crystals and sit there and rub them, rub them together uh, to get an understanding of this. Okay, seek, ye f seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. What, all what things? The things that he has been talking about. Right. All the things that are your basic needs in life. Mm -hmm. He's saying you can seek God first. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be taken care of. They'll be added to you. First the sermon, then the commentary. I've said a couple of times, and I said right in the beginning of this study of the Sermon on the Mount, that the Beatitudes were the sermon. Mm -hmm. Jesus preached the sermon when he spoke the Beatitudes. Yes, yeah. Now the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is kind of a commentary on the Beatitudes, yes. and then the rest of the Bible is all a commentary on what Jesus spoke here, yes. right? Yes. 
Christ. Jesus Christ said in the very beginning, he said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Matthew 5, 6. That was at the beginning of the study. And if you didn't hear that, if you didn't see that part of the study, I, I really want to encourage you to go back because all of these sessions of this study are available on our website at, at BibleTalk.com and, and listen to that study on this particular beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. And that's what we're talking about here. I said you'll be satisfied. Right. right? You'll be content. You you'll be, be satisfied. You won't be in want. And most importantly, you'll not be in need. That's right. Because God will change your heart. And I promise you, listen to me. I talk about the difference between wants and needs. We all have wants. Okay? Mm -hmm. I, I understand that. When you begin to rejoice in the things that God has given you that you need. Your wants change. Like with Solomon. Remember I said with Solomon? Mm -hmm. He asked for one thing and God said, because you asked that thing, it was the right thing to ask. Right. He said, I'll give you that, but I'll also give you this. All of a sudden, God gives you the things that you want in addition to the things that you need. Why? Because He loves you. Yes. Because He loves you. That's why. Not because He has to. Not because he has to earn your love or respect, but because he loves you. Mm. And the best part is, he actually knows what you need. That's right. He actually knows what you want. That's right. What, you know, I mean, the things that will give you satisfaction, the things that will please you. God knows. You don't. That's right. He knows. I, if, you can, if you can look at me in the eyeball right now on this camera and tell me how many hairs are on your head. Mm. <laughs> Impossible. Oh, but he knows. Yes, he does. <laughs> he knows everything around your head. He's the God of the impossible. But, but the thing is, He knows you. Yes, He does. So much better than you know you. Mm. That He will give you things that will fill your life with joy. That's His desire. Jesus said, I came that you might have joy. And that your joy might be made full. He will give the, you the things that give you truly abundant life. Mm. Not the things that the world promises it will give you abundant life, and then they fail to satisfy it. Because God knows. He will give you the things that will make you filled with joy. He will give you the things that will give you an abundant life. Because He knows what they are. You don't. By the way, if you think that you do, send me a postcard with the number of all the hairs on your head. Now, some of that, some of you may have an easier time than others, yes. but we're not talking about baldness because I ain't <laughs> no. going to have it happen to me what happened when they went to Elijah and the bears came out. That's, That's another right. story. Okay. Um, uh, just, just put it on a postcard, uh, wrap it up in a $100 bill, and mail it off to us, and you may win the prize. <laughs> you better tell them not to do that. Don't do that. Uh, I'm just was that not only kidding? No, yes. No. Okay. You got to do this first. Now, when I say first, a lot of people think, okay, I'll do that, then I can get to doing what I want. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay. So that means, like, if I sit there and I read the Bible for five minutes, then I can go do what I want. That's not, that's not what this is. The first part here, by the way, the Greek word is proton, or protus, depending on whether you're reading the King James or New American Standard. A proton is like the uh, fundamental building block in, in nature. Yes. The atoms are composed of protons, protons right? right? Jesus Christ is the foundation upon which everything is built. God the Father is, is building His church. Jesus is building a church, but it's built upon Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. He is the cornerstone, mm -hmm. all right? If you build, go out and build a building and don't put a foundation down, don't put that footer around, don't put a cornerstone down, you know what happens? Alice and I lived, <laughs> lived in, in Central America. Uh, that's not Kansas. That's down in Latin America, in, you know, between Mexico and Guatemala, down in that area. And we lived in an area which is uh, fairly primitive. And the, the, the soil is all clay. It's, it's all about that high. If you can see my fingers, it's about that far above sea level. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you're always building things. And they would buy, I actually did some logging on the Mosquito Coast here uh, because I'd go out and minister with guys because I had to c cut trees and drive trees into the ground to try and set. 
but for example, uh, just before we left, they had built one big building, and they built this very impressive building. And like uh, four weeks after they built it, it was lopsided. It was lopsided because the foundation wasn't there. The foundation wasn't there. So when he says that we have to build, do this first, the seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, mm -hmm. that is the foundation upon which every part of your life has to be yeah. built and laid. That's right. It's not like just a substitute, like I can do this and then put that to the side and then go do this. Mm -hmm. No, no. You do this and then you build upon that. Right. If that's making sense to you. Okay? So everything you had to, that you do in life, and I'm talking about, listen, if you're not married and you're, you're a young man or a young woman out there, I'm telling you, you better be seeking God. You know, you can go to eHarmony or whatever those websites are, and, but if you do that before, you have built a foundation with the Lord, that thing's going to tip right over. You're going to have the lean and tower pizza and it's going to fall, it's going to topple. If you're out seeking a job, and you're seeking that job without having first sought the Lord God, His kingdom, and His righteousness, no matter what happens with that job, it will be built and it will topple. Mm -hmm. Now, how do I know that? <coughs> it's in the Sermon on the Mount. That's how I know it. In Matthew 7, near the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. You see, I told you this Sermon on the Mount is cohesive. In the beginning, he said, Seek ye, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And now he's saying, Seek first his righteousness, his kingdom and his righteousness. And he says, If you don't, you're going to be building something on sand because the foundation will not be there. And it'll crumble, it'll topple, mm -hmm. it'll fall. It will not last. Your marriage has to be built on the foundation of yes. Jesus Christ. Your work life has to be built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Everything that you do in life had better be set upon that foundation of seeking His kingdom and His righteousness. Okay, so in conclusion, Matthew 6.34 So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And that's the truth. So he's been talking about this, and now he says, okay, so don't worry about tomorrow. Don't, don't worry about, you know, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Why? He's explained why. Because of your value. It boils down to, it boils down to the reason you don't have to worry is because of how much God the Father loves you. That's why you don't have to worry. Now, so he's talking about don't worry about tomorrow. That means you're supposed to live today. Now, I'm going to say this because it appears to me by the observation of my 68 years of life that most people either live yesterday or they live tomorrow. Right. The future, the past. They're living in the glory of the, the good old days mm -hmm. or the way things used to be before the job market collapsed or the way things used to be before the housing market collapsed. They're or they're, they're, hoping or for. They're, li they're living in tomorrow what they're hoping for. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be great once I get. Mm -hmm. It's going to get, be great once, once I have. Time. It's going to be great once. And so they're, they're living, their life is wrapped up either in yesterday or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is saying, no, live today. Live today. Now, let's just talk about yesterday for a minute, all right? Don't live yesterday. Mm -hmm. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it. But one thing I do... Forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards a goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's Paul in Philippians chapter 3. Forgetting what lies behind. Now, for us, the redeemed, our past is the testimony of those who have gone before us. It's not what happened to you yesterday, last week or last year. Okay? Mm -hmm. Our yesterday is this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. That's Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Right? The men of old. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on in Hebrews 12 and it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, 
Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and run with endurance the race. Okay, so we have this cloud of witnesses. You see, your past is not what happened to you last week. For the redeemed, your past, your yesterday, your past is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Your yesterday is Moses, David, Peter, and Paul. Our past is in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's the glory of our past. That's that history. That's our, that's our yesterday. And you know what? If you're relying on what happened to you physically yesterday, you're going to get over it. Tomorrow. Well, it says in Proverbs 27.1, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. I'm going to tell you, life is fragile. Amen. You have no guarantee of tomorrow. That's right. Whatsoever. No. None whatsoever. Think about this parable that Jesus told. This is from Luke chapter 12. Uh, Jesus told him a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now all, now who will own what you have prepared? Mm. Life on this old planet is fragile. Yes. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. There will be afflictions. There's no doubt about that. But the promise of God is that he will deliver you. Hallelujah. Your future is not tomorrow. Listen to me now. Your future is not tomorrow. Your future is eternity. The perfect peace that we've been talking about, the perfect peace that we're to have that wipes out all anxiety, mm. the perfect peace that wipes out all fear is based on your assurance of your future. Because Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. John 14, 1 through 3. Your future is assured. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. Mm. Jesus Christ has taken care of you tomorrow. You don't have to be, you don't have to try and live in the past, because you have a glorious past that you can recall. It is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Peter, Paul. Mm. It is the saints that have gone on before us. So now what you can do is you can focus on today and live today to the fullest so you don't miss out on God and the things of God. I think that's a great place to stop because that finishes up the sixth chapter. Thank you, Jesus. So in our next session, we'll go into the, the seventh and last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. And, and I pray that you're being blessed by this. And again, I want to remind you, if you have questions or comments, just write to us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you at office at BibleTalk.com. So, but until the next time, let me leave you with this. Father, we just pray, Lord God. We, we, first of all, we just give you thanks. We bless your name and give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus, that you did demonstrate exactly how precious we are to you, how much you love us. Lord, and, and help this to become a reality in our lives, that we walk in that faith that you have spoken into existence in our lives, that we would be a living testimony to the rest of the world, that we would be what your son said at the beginning of this sermon, Lord God, that we would become that salt of the earth and that light of the world that would shine forth your love and your power and your glory into the world around us. Lord, just use us for the glory of your name. And help us, Lord God, by the power of your Spirit that dwells within us, to be faithful to you and your call in our lives. I just ask that, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Well, God bless you, and goodbye until next time. Remember, Jesus loves you a lot.